Shalom to you. It's always good to be back on a Shabbat in the house of the Most High to be able to sing praises to him and to see, to see all of you. I look forward to each week <clears throat> being in your presence and being able to greet you and talk to you. And, you know, that's what Israel is all about. There's an interesting aspect of what we're preparing for, and that is to be back in the land with the Most High in the Messianic era. And um, during that particular time, there's not going to be any it's not going to be any, maybe, maybe I'll honor the Sabbath and maybe I won't. It's not going to be like that. And um, there is an interesting aspect of Shabbat. And that is that, and there's, there's an interesting aspect about the mitzvot that we're talking about and teaching And we have to, while we're trying to do our best to honor and walk in the teachings of the Most High in this exile, I think that uh, many of us take a lot of the things that the Most High has asked us to do for granted or we take them lightly. I'm going to open up today in the book of Jeremiah, who Jeremiah chapter number two. Didn't put it on the board, but we're going to read for a minute. Because it's important for us to understand and know exactly what the situation really is. Jeremiah, who chapter number two, verse four. Hear the word of Yahweh, house of Yaakov, and all the families of the house of Yisrael. He, Yaakov is Israel, and he mentions Yaakov, he mentions also the nation. Here is what Yahweh says. What did your ancestors find wrong with me to make them go so far away from me? to make them go after nothings and become themselves nothings. What, what did they find wrong? What did they find wrong with me? That is a question that we ask today. And as I discussed it in last night's class, you have to wonder what was going on in the minds of our ancestors that caused them to want to be so much like the nations to which this is where we are today. They didn't ask, where is Yahweh? And as I remember growing up in the Christian church, I don't remember anybody asking, where is God? Where is, where is God? They just took God for granted. And, uh, so they didn't ask, where is Yahweh who brought us out of the land of Mitzrayim, who led us through the desert, through a land of waste and ravines, through a land of drought, death, dark shadows, through a land where no one travels and where no one ever lived. The Most High took us through this, took our ancestors through there. And then he says, I brought you into a fertile land, to enjoy its fruits and all its good things. In other words, I gave you good things. I gave you fertile land. I gave you good things. I made your life pleasant. We destroyed all of the enemies that were coming against you. You were victorious in battle and in war. I brought you to good things, but when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage loathsome. This is the part that I want to get to in verse number eight. 
the Kohanim The Kohanim didn't ask, where is Yahweh? Those who deal with the Torah did not know me. Those who deal with the Torah did not know me. Now, this is an interesting, an interesting part of, of Jeremiah's words and the Most High's words to Jeremiah to speak to Israel. We're going to read in our opening today from our board from the book of Malachi. This particular reference here in verse number eight, those who deal with Torah did not know me. The people's shepherds rebelled against me. The prophets prophesied to Baal and went after things of no value. Kohanim, Kohanim are responsible for teaching Torah. That's their job. Their job is to, is to help Israel to stay the course in line with what the Torah is teaching them and telling them as to how they are to deport themselves and how they are to live with him. If your teachers do not know the Most High. If your teachers do not know the Most High, you are in trouble. Now, I'm going to say to you that the majority of people who pick up a Bible and take their position at the head of the people in the pulpit over the podium to proclaim themselves pastors and teachers of the Most High's Word, if they don't know the Most High, you're in trouble. So what are you saying, Rabbi? Well, I am saying that there are a lot of people that know of God and they know of the Most High, but they don't know him. To know somebody is to have the kind of relationship with them that is intimate. You know them. You know you know their essence. You know their you know their makeup. You know their constitution. You know what makes them tick. And if those who are teaching you supposedly God's word don't know him, you're in trouble. So I state my case against you, says Yahweh, and state it against your grandchildren also. Cross to the coast of the Kittim and look, send to Kedar and observe closely and see if anything like this has happened before. Has a nation ever exchanged its gods and theirs are not gods at all? Yet my people have exchanged their glory for something without value. Now, the question on the table is, Sean, fix my mic, please. Why? 
What nation of people that have a nation, have gods, what of them have ever abdicated their gods to be a part of or join another nation's gods? What, who, what, where? Where has that ever happened? He says it's never happened. Yet you, Israel, have abdicated me. Now, the task of the Kohanim is to teach. Let's go to Malachi chapter 2, verses 1 through 7, and let's see what it has to say. Now, Kohanim, this command is for you. Kohanim is teachers. So individuals who have the responsibility of teaching in the mind of the Most High, his word, are called Kohanim. The Most High has, has these offices. He has Levine, he ha out of which come Kohanim, out, out of which call, come Haggadol Kohanim, or High Priest. These are the individuals who are responsible for holding Israel to the task of obedience in Torah. Now, call me, this is the command is for you. If you won't listen, and if you won't pay attention honoring my name, says Yahweh Shavuot, and please pay attention here, Honoring my name. The Most High's name is not God. I want you to honor my name. If you have been raised in a good family, and it really doesn't matter if it was a bad family, the Most High says to us, as a commandment, honor your mothers and fathers. The majority of us honor our parents and we honor our father. He may not have been a good father, but I still honor him because I have his name. I heard one of the, one of the uh, Hall of Fame honorees say, in his speech to his son. He said, I don't have much of importance to give you except my name. And through my life, I've tried to live a life by which you would honor my name. The Most High is our Father. So he says, pay attention to honoring my name. My name, Yahweh, written in the scriptures, Shemot chapter 3, I think it is, verse 15. Masha asked him, who shall I say sent me? Tell them that yod heh vav -He, and this shall be my name throughout all generations. So let's go back and read this again. Now, Corning, this command is for you. If you won't listen, if you won't pay attention, honoring my name, says Yahweh Savo, then I will send the curse on you. What curse? What curse? Well, since we're dealing with the prophet, we have to go back to the place in Torah where the Most High has outlined all of the curses 
that befall Israel and those who abandon his Torah and don't follow them. So I send you back, starting with Devarim chapter 28, verses 15 through 69, I send you also over to Vayikra, I forget which chapter it is, but he talks about, and if you won't pay attention, this shall be for you seven times. And if you won't pay attention, this will be for you. And if you won't pay attention, this will be for you. So Malachi is referring to all of the curses. I will turn your blessings into curses. Now, the idea of turning blessings into curses we have to know what a blessing really is. The fact that you lost your house is not a curse on your house. You lost your house because you didn't pay the mortgage. Losing your car is not a curse on the car. You lost the car because you didn't pay the note on the car. While you called it a blessing when you got it, oh, I got a blessing, I got blessed. We got a new house, we got a blessing. That's not a blessing, that's a mortgage. The Most High blesses us with something that continues to give. And when we look at the things that the Most High blesses us with, where I say I'm blessed with something that he continues to give me, he continues to give me the, I, the ability to inhale and exhale. He gives me the ability to have mobility of my limbs and to function and to have reasonable health in that. That's a blessing. It continues to give. A blessing is also that his spirit, his spirit continues to abide with you and in you, and it continues to a point where it's not, I hope, I think, no, I know that his spirit is residing in me and functioning in me, and it continues to revive me, and it continues to, continues to flow through me. So now he says, I will turn all of this that we call a blessing into curses. Well, how are the curses or how do the curses come about and affect us? Well, we are confronted with things in our lives because of the way we live. Now, I'm not talking about old age because old age brings its afflictions with us. As a matter of fact, Yaakov, Yaakov was the first individual in scripture to, be, to fall ill by an illness in his body and die. Everybody that preceded him, they didn't fall ill and die. They just sneezed and their life was gone. But if you read scripture over in the book where he talked, where Joseph goes down into Mitzrayim and he meets with Joseph and talks about Yaakov became, became old and he became ill. That's the first text of scripture you're going to find anybody becoming ill. So now we look at all of these things, blessings. Many people are afflicted in their bodies and they're cursed because of the failure to function and walk in the ways of the Most High. And there are other things that he brings upon us in terms of curses that we're not even we're not even knowledgeable of. We don't even know. It just happens. And we don't even know why it happens. So you go, why is this happening? It just happens. Yes, I will curse them because you pay no attention. Who pays no attention? Koanim, your teachers don't pay any attention. I will reject your seed. I will throw dung in your faces. The dung from your festival offerings 
<laughs> now let's let's look let's 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 look at this for a minute. Let's look at this for a minute. The dung from your festival offerings. Let's talk about that for a minute. What's the dung from your festival offerings? Well, let's talk about festival offerings for a minute. In Israel, when there are festivals, you bring offerings, and the offerings are animal offerings, animal sacrifices. Those animal offerings and those animal sacrifices have to be slaughtered and they have to be presented. So when you slaughter the animal, that which comes out of the animal is called dung. And he says to you, I'll take that and I'll throw it in your face. And you will be carted off with it. Then you will know that I sent you this command to affirm my covenant with Levi, says Yahweh Sabaoth. My covenant with him was one of life and peace, and I gave him these things. It was also one of fear. It was also one of fear. And he feared me. He was in awe of my name. So now the question has to be, in the world that we live in, in the which that we talk about somebody called God, who is this Yahweh, the question on the table is, is there any fear in the minds and hearts of the people? And the question, the answer to that is how can you fear someone that you don't know? I feared my father. Fear in the aspect of reverence and respect. How can you have reverence and respect for Yahweh, whom God, whom we call Yahweh, if you don't know him? And the Most High says, my kohanim do not know me. The teachers do not know me. Oh, I'm going to say it. Your pastors do not know, do not know the God of Israel. Your teachers do not know the God of Israel. If they knew the God of Israel and had an intimate relationship, they would teach you fear and, also, and, and be in awe of his name. You would have respect for his name. I am very proud to be a whole man. That's my father's name. That was my grandfather's name. I'm proud to be a whole man. And my children are proud to be Holmans. The name carries something. The, main, the name means something. The name of the Most High ought to mean something to those who are, are teaching you and trying to prepare you for eternal life. But if they're preparing you for eternal life in a vein or in a way that seems right unto men, but the end thereof is destruction, they're more concerned with you fearing them and having reverence for them than having fear and being in awe of the one who has created us. The true Torah is in his mouth. Whose mouth? It's in the mouth of Levi. It's in the mouth of the Kohenim. And no dishonesty was found on his 
lips. Who? Corny, believe it. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many away from sin. Let's talk about this for a minute. In order to turn people away from sin, you have to know what sin is. Sin is not you going to the nightclub. Sin is not you having a little drink of alcohol. Sin is not you dancing on the dance floor. That's not sin. You, you and I were taught that that was sin and that's what the nations do. And if we're taught that we should come out from among them and be separate. That's not the separation that the Most High is promoting for us to, 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 to resolve ourselves from. Sin, the Kohanim's lips, the Lilium, the Koranim, the true Torah, was on his mouth, and no dishonesty was found on his lips. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many away from breaking the Torah. Sin is Torah. When we don't walk in Torah, we sin. That's missing the mark. And I'm afraid that many of you that have heard my voice over the years as we've taught Torah, I'm afraid that we have taken the Torah too lightly. In our desire to walk in Torah, we've taken it lightly and we've treated it much like we treated Christianity when we were there. One of the things that is not going to happen if you're preparing to go to the land, there's one thing that's not going to happen. And the continent of Africa is a very large continent for which the Most High even said he's going to enlarge the borders of, 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 of the continent of our land. You and I are going to be displaced in the land from Jerusalem. We're all not going to live in Jerusalem. And in all the little places that the Most High is going to designate the land to be divided amongst the 12 sons of Israel and sparse out, there are not going to be little factions of Baptist Israel, Kojic Israel, Episcopalian Israel, Catholic Israel, and all this denominational mess that we're living in today, in the land there, he said, the name will be one, the language will be one, and Torah will be taught. And if you don't walk in Torah, I don't care what faction of the of the continent you live in, you will die. If you don't honor the, 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 the commandments of the Most High, you will die. You can talk about Torah all you want to. Torah is not the culture of Israel. Torah is the mitzvot and the commandments given to Israel. And if we don't pay attention to the nuances that are there and follow the narrative completely, you're not walking in Torah. <clears throat> 
There's not going to be any getting mad at your Kohanim in your little hamlet in Africa and walking off and say, well, I'm just not going to go. I'm not going to, I'm not going to Shabbat no more. I'm not going no more. We're going to start. No, that's not going to happen. You will die. You will die. A Kohanim's lips should safeguard knowledge and the people should seek Torah from his mouth because he is the messenger of Yahweh. So the task of the Kohanim, the task of the teacher, is to safeguard knowledge Knowledge of what? Knowledge of Torah. And the people should seek Torah from his mouth. You should be seeking Torah from my mouth. You should be teach, seeking Torah from Appleton, from calling Appleton's mouth. You should be seeking Torah from Brother Yochanan's mouth. They are, we are the calling in this house. You should be seeking Torah from our mouth. It is our job to safeguard knowledge and to Teach the Father's word. He didn't say that you're supposed to seek Torah from your own mouth. So you can get mad, leave, and go home and not come to congregation. And there's a problem with that. Israel doesn't have the opportunity to get mad and walk off. I don't find any writing with Masha and the congregation where somebody got mad at him and walked off and all of them that did died. If we're going to walk in Torah, then let's walk in Torah. If you're going to call yourself a Hebrew, then be a Hebrew. Here's the issue. And I'm not begging anybody to do anything. That's not my job. My job is to safeguard knowledge. That's my job. My job is to be a messenger for Yahweh. That's my job. But if you go to Vayikra, chapter 23, and you look and read the commandment that's there in relationship to honoring the Shabbat, the Sabbath, the Torah commandment says that on the Shabbat you shall have a holy convocation. It didn't say you shall stay home. It said you shall have a holy convocation. And if you're not having a holy convocation and you're able to do that, you are breaking Torah. And that, my sisters and brothers, is sin. You wanted me to teach Torah. Malachi said that's what I'm supposed to do. I'm not trying to coerce you to fill the house. That's not my job. My job is to inform you with the knowledge of what Torah application is all about. Miss Vaughn. Shemot chapter 23, verses 1 through 2. You are not to repeat false rumors. Do not join hands with the wicked by offering perjury, falsifying an affirmation to tell the truth. That's what perjury is.
whatever you heard, whatever you heard, if you can't validate what you heard, it's a false rumor. And it is also called gossip. And it is also referred to in scripture as leprosy. It is also the requirement that a person that has that must be separated from the community and set outside the community of Israel until they have been purified. Don't follow the crowd when it does what is wrong. Do not allow the pop. And don't allow the popular view to sway you into offering testimony for any cause if the effort will be to pervert justice. <clears throat> don't do that. The major part of this mitzvot is to do not follow the crowd. If the crowd wants to go in an opposite direction of Torah, you're not to follow them. I, if in... 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. In 16 years that I have been Hebraic and teaching Torah, if by any reason of thought that I taught you something with forethought of malice that did not line up with Torah, we would have had my funeral a long time ago. That's how much I fear, I'm in awe of the Most High and the assignment that he has given me to his people. If I would have taught you anything that violated the principles of Torah with malice of forethought, we would have had my funeral already and somebody else would be leading, leading the congregation. But I haven't done that. I've taught you Torah to the best of my knowledge and ability and the Most High has honored that. So, first thing we don't do is we don't follow the crowd when it does what is wrong. Well, what's wrong? Well, let's think about it for a minute. If anything within the community of First Tabernacle or Fellowship, and I can only speak to us, has happened that was wrong, and you adhered to what was wrong and followed it, you are in, you have broken a commandment of the Most High. If someone told you that you shouldn't go and assemble with that congregation for whatever reason, when the congregation itself did not break faith with the Most High, that is wrong. And it's wicked. We're talking application here. And I'm going to tell you right now, that will never happen in the land. If that happens in the land, you will be dead. Cut off. Done. Finished. So what you should do if you're guilty of this, you should get up off of your chair, open your mouth, 
run around your kitchen, run around your living room, shout and make some noise and dance and thank the Most High for grace. However, that does not mean that in some way or somewhere in your lifespan, in your, in your necklace, that curses will not befall you. Things will happen and you won't even know why. Because you will have forget, you will have forgotten that you have broken faith with the Most High and His commandments. You all asked me to teach these. I'm glad you did. Because that's what I'm supposed to be doing. Shemot 30, 31 to 30. The prohibition to anoint a person's body with anointing oil. Now, anointing oil is made up of certain ingredients that the Most High has written in Scripture. And in the Christian church, we have this thing called anointing oil. And everybody in my day that I was there within it we brought our bottle of olive oil to the pastor who prayed over it, made an anointing. We took it home, and when we got sick or whatever, we'd anoint ourselves with a, with a little oil. And any time we fasted, we had to anoint ourselves with the oil. I don't see any verbiage in Scripture where when the Most High called to fast, he asked us to anoint our heads with, 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 with oil. So that is a passed down behavior from somewhere that it started that does not line up with scripture. Tell the people of Israel, this is to be a holy anointing now. Now we have to go back up. You have to go back up in this, in this, in this, in this, in this book here, in this writing, and see what the what the constitution or what the ingredients of anointing oil are. This is to be holy anointing oil. For me. For who? For the Most High. It is not to be used for anointing a person's body. So if the anointing oil that the Most High prescribed is not to be used for anointing a body, where did we get the idea that olive oil was supposed to be used to anoint the body? And what purpose does it serve? And you are not to make any like it with the same composition of its ingredients. It is holy, and you are to treat it as holy. Whoever makes any like it or uses it on an unauthorized person is to be cut off. You're dead. You're finished. You're through. <sighs> My calling. But Appleton, <laughs> we often talk about, and by the Yokanon, we often talk about what's the difficulty with people making the transition to the Hebraic way? Well, all of this stuff gets in the way. All of this gets in the way. This, this is what we were taught. This is all we know. Now you're telling me that we're not, I'm not telling you that. Script, I'm just reading. And I'm asking a question. If the Most High says that a anointing, you are not, nah, come on, come on, come on, come on, my pen. Come on, come on, come on, come on. If he says it's not to be used for anointing a person's body, What's not supposed to? Anointing oil. But you call olive oil anointing oil, then you're using it for the same purpose. For what? Not supposed to happen. Uh, 
underlying purpose, it is improper for common folk to use this exalted oil that is housed in the temple. Oh, where's the olive oil at? It's on the podium in the temple, in the house. It is to be used only on the choices of the nation of Israel. Now, here's I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you purpose of application. Coronine, you can anoint your teachers, you can anoint your pastors, although the Most High doesn't have pastors, he has Kohanim, Levium. So the Kohanim can be anointed, the king can be anointed, and the holy, ooh, I just spoiled the, the Hoy article, the holy articles can be anointed by the common meaning deprived of this oil, it will remain most precious in our eyes. Prohibition to replicate the anointing oil. You are not to make any like it, with the same composition of ingredients. It is holy and you are to treat it as holy. <clears throat> Whoever makes any of it, and uses it on any unauthorized person, you will be cut off. Cut off means you will be dead. Prohibition to replicate the incense. Yahweh said to Moshe, take aromatic plant substances, balsam, resin, sweet, oinka, root, bitter, balkum, gum, these spices along with frankincense, all in equal quantities, and make incense. Blend and perfume as would an expert perfume maker, salted, pure, and holy. You are to grind up some of it very finely and put it in front of the testimony in the tent of meeting where I will meet with you. You are to regard it as especially holy. You are not to make for your own use, any incense like it. With the same composition of ingredients, you are to treat it as holy for Yahweh. Whoever makes it, makes up any like it and uses it as perfume is to be cut off from his people. So now, do you think, do you think that there might be some perfumers that make perfume out there that have found this formula and have combined these substances and made perfume out of them? Do you think maybe they've, they've seen that? And maybe you bought it and you didn't know what the composition of it was? Well, I didn't know. Well, once again, let me let me let me be forthright and upfront with you. These mitzvot that I'm reading to you, giving explanation to you of, they are for Hebrew Israel who have come to the knowledge of truth. They are not for Hebrew Israel who has not come to the knowledge of truth. But for Hebrew Israel who has come to the knowledge of truth, these commandments apply to us. And to those of you who want to join with Hebrew Israel, then you would have to make application of the teachings that we're sharing with you concerning the knowledge and application of Torah. Hmm. The prohibition in Shemot 2034 to consume idolatrous worship. Be careful. I got to bring my pen up again now. Be careful not to make a covenant with the people, not to make a covenant with people living in the land where you are going. Now, while it's true that Israel was going to Canaan, 
the land that flowed with milk and honey that the Most High had promised them. We are in this exile. And we have gone to a land and we're living with people in the land where we have come to live. Be careful not to make a covenant with them so that they won't become a snare within your own borders. Now, unfortunately, we can't demolish the things that cause them to worship, okay? We can't do that. But whatever they're worshiping, we are not to bow down to any other God. Since Yahweh, whose name is very name is his jealous, is jealous El. We're not to bow down. So now let's talk about worship for a minute. We talked about this the other day in our podcast. What constitutes worship? The thing that constitutes worship is when I pay homage and when I bow down to something or some idea that is not associated with the Most High. Let me make this very clear to you. Because we get on this place, well, of trying to define idolatry and what idolatry is, and we know what it is. And there are certain times of the year that show up that are very, that we're very in line with. That Easter we don't worship, it's idolatrous. Christmas, we don't worship, it's idolatrous. But Easter and Christmas and Thanksgiving are times of family gatherings. The family gathers. It is not my task or my job to push my belief onto my family if they're not believers. Not my job. Not what I'm supposed to do. It's my job to make known, however, if I go, and I've told you before, and there's probably a lot of you that will not agree with me, I'm not missing a good meal. If it's Easter or Christmas or Thanksgiving or New Year's and the family is gathering, and there's going to be food. Personally, I'm not missing a good meal. I'm not missing collard greens, candy yams, mac and cheese, fried chicken, cornbread. I'm not missing that because the family is gathering on a day that is idolatrous. I'm not going there to bow down nor to agree with the idolatrous reason for the gathering. That's not why I'm going. My soul, my spirit is not worshiping that. I am going to eat a meal and fellowship with my family. Because in fellowshipping with my family, I am still walking out Torah. That's right. That's right. Because my family knows that I don't eat pork. They know that I don't eat fish without fins and scales. They know I'm not going to eat no gumbo. And I'm walking out Torah in their presence. And you're concerned about your family. Your family needs to see you and I walking out the mitzvot in their presence and not become stained. I'm not, I'm not bringing no Easter basket to my grandchildren. 
I'm not going shopping and buying no Santa Claus gift gift to my grandchildren. I'm not doing that. I'm going to eat. Ain't passing up no sweet potato pie. Ain't passing up no Parker House rolls that my mama done made. Ain't doing that. Just because, well, it's Easter. I'm not going to do my family's house because they celebrate. They are celebrating Easter. I'm not. <laughs> and I'm not making a covenant with him. Do not make a covenant with the people living in the land. It will cause you to go astray after their gods. That's where our people are. And sacrifice to their gods. That's where our people are. Then they will invite you to join them in eating. Uh-oh. Well, they see, they're... No, they didn't invite me to, I had joined myself to eat, but not for the purpose of making a covenant. I didn't make a covenant with them. Uh, Balaam said this. You will take their daughters as wives for your sons, and the daughters will prostitute themselves to their own gods and make your sons do the same. So the idea is not to join an idolatrous worship. I'm not bowing down. I'm not making a covenant with anybody. I'm not violating the principles of the covenant that I've made with the Most High. I'm going to walk out my faith and my relationship with the Most High so people will know I go places today and with I meet with families and they invite me over and they tell the people, says, you know, Bob don't eat pork. Bob don't eat shrimp. And what do they do for me? They cook something that I can eat. They honor, they honor, they honor where I am. Even amongst my family. My family honors the fact that they know that I don't eat outside the parameters of Torah. Prohibition to kindle a fire on the Shabbat. You are not to kindle a fire in any of your homes on Shabbat. The underlying purpose is to glorify this day so that it should be a day of rest. <laughs> what does that mean? I have, over the course of being a Torah teacher, I have explained this particular mitzvot many ways. And I have to apologize to you because in some aspects, I have attempted to skate it by spiritualizing it. And I tried to spiritualize it on the other side of the book which says what a violent thing the tongue is, that we should, a tongue that kindles a fire. And I try to say, well, you're not supposed to, you're not supposed to get angry with your husband and your wife. You're not supposed to do this on the Sabbath because that's kindling a fire. That's not what the text says. Let's bring it back, let's bring it back to its, to its place. What does the Most High mean when he says, you are not to kindle a fire in any of your homes on Shabbat? 
What does he mean? Don't light one. For what purpose? Now there's a purpose. There's a purpose. He doesn't say that you're not supposed to kindle a fire for the purpose of keeping warm. He doesn't expect you to be cold. It's not what it's about. It's about cooking. So, by application of Torah, from the time that the sun comes up in the morning when the Shabbat begins until the sun sets in the evening, we should not be lighting our stoves to cook a meal that wasn't previously already made. Because the object of Sabbat is not to put into existence something that doesn't already exist. If I'm lighting a fire to cook a meal, then that meal is a new, a new item. It's a new, it's a new, it's a new, it's a new. I, I'm creating something new. And we're not supposed to create things on the Shabbat. I know. Skating. I skated all around it. So one day, the Most High asked me a question. He says, what does that mean? I'm skating. He says to me again, what does that mean? What's the purpose of the corny? What's the purpose of the corny? To do what? Safe guard knowledge and to teach Torah. That's the responsibility of the Kohanim. So now, if I have cooked something prior to Shabbat, that requires warming up. It's not creating. It's not new. It's not fresh. All I'm doing is warming it up. And we have two ways to approach this. <laughs> two ways to approach this. <laughs> you can fix something the day before that doesn't require warming up. Or you can have a sandwich. <laughs> you're not going to like, some of you are not going to like this one. Because the mitzvot apply to the nations. They apply, I mean, excuse me, the mitzvot apply to Israel. They don't apply to the nations. They apply to Israel. And Nehemiah is not a mitzvot that has been presented to Israel out of the mouth of the Most High. So we can fix this and go in coast and buy me some chicken. <laughs> That's hot. That's hot. Or anywhere else is hot because the, the mitzvot doesn't apply to the nation. It applies to Israel. So we can satisfy this particular mitzvah. You all following me here? I mean, we're just not supposed to. The issue is, 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 is the, the idea is, whoops. Oh, oh, back, back, back. Get the board, hit the board. Yeah. Ah, come on. Come on. Ah, come on, get back. 
Ah, did I go that far? The idea of killing a fire is all about creating. It's all about creating. Making something that wasn't already made. Okay? This gets in our way. This this gets this gets in our this gets in our I'm transitioning to becoming a Hebrew and I got all these rules that are getting in my way. Really ain't that difficult. It's just changing your way of life. The most high said these commandments, what I'm giving you, shall be what? A way of life. Now, I'll ask you a question. I have a question. When you came, quote, quote, out of the world and got saved in the church, did you change your way of life? Oh, you were very concerned about it because perhaps maybe your husband or your wife wasn't saved and you you were fretting the idea, God, I got to go home. I got to tell my wife I just got saved. Man, what's that mean? Oh, all them things we used to do together, I got saved, honey. We can't do those no more. I, 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 I got to go tell my husband. I got to go tell my wife. What were you doing? Changing your way of life. You didn't have a problem with it then. Now we come to Torah, and Torah provides you with a different way of life, and we're we trying to figure out how we can skirt around it. Well, I can't do that. I'm just saying. Been there, done that. Prohibition to eat fat or blood. It is a permanent regulation through all your generation. Everybody say permanent. permanent. Wherever you live, that you will eat neither fat nor blood. <laughs> I declare. <laughs> I declare that back in the day, I love me some crispy, fat fried pork scrans. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. Pork rind, pork skin. Oh yeah, that's fat. That's fried fried. That's not a fried fried fat. Fat is suitable for burning for fuel. They are thick and hard to digest. Fat's not even good for your, for your digestive system. And one of the other things that's good, was good, is when you roast a good piece of meat and it gets all seasoned up, Oh, that fat with that season on sure tastes good. <laughs> Don't eat it. It's good for fuel. <clears throat> While the soul is in the blood, the effect of eating blood, man assimilates within himself the animal's life force. Therefore, diluting the spiritual quality of his own soul. Here's the problem with this. Here's the problem with this. The problem with this is that you don't have the sense of feeling this taking place. 
but it's happening within the constitution of your body and within the constitution of your soul. And if the Most High said it's diluting the spiritual quality of your soul, it's diluting the spiritual quality of your soul, even if it's a little bit at a time. It's harming you. I'm just, I'm just teaching the misfits. Well, that's your commentary. That's your interpretation. No, no, no. I tell you what you do. Ask a dietitian if, if fat is a good thing to consume into your body. Ask them that. Ask them if blood is a good thing to consume into your body other than by virtue of a transfusion. See what they say. One more and we're done for today. Now, I'm gonna say this for next week because there are some things that follow that that I gotta talk about. These are the mitzvot that I wanted to share with you today. They're, I think they are essential to our understanding and application. The task that I have before me each week that I come to teach you is to safeguard knowledge and to teach Torah. The explanations of Torah should flow from the Kohanim's mouth. Some things that I've said today, you may not agree with personally. However, whatever that might be is not outside the parameters of Torah. <clears throat> and we'll talk, about, we'll talk about your conscience next week, next time I, I teach, and the offerings that have to be made for things that fall within the parameters of the four offerings. But one thing for certain, that if we violate a Torah principle with malice of forethought, there is no sacrifice that we can give the Most High for doing that. Remember, I opened with some things in relationship to Torah that Torah is specific about. And I don't know if in this day and time that we live in, whether or not we have to redefine, did I say redefine? We have to redefine what the word convocation means. I don't know. But I'm certainly going to look at it going to study it, because one of the things I can't do is I can't change the narrative that the Most High has put on one of His commandments. I can't change that. I have to do the best job that I can to explain it and help us to be obedient to it. Thank you so much for your time today. Pray that what I have said has been beneficial to your thought process. And all thy getting, get an understanding. Come, let us reason together. Yahweh Yasah Yahweh Penai Valeka by Yasham Laka Shalom. May Yahweh bless each and every one of you. May He make His face to shine upon you and show you His favor. May Yahweh lift up His face toward you and give you Shalom, give you peace. May you rejoice in the gladness of His Son 
and his light. Sun meaning that which comes from above that shines down on you. And may you be perfected in his love. Until next time, shalom.